Good afternoon and welcome to this event organized by the Herculaneum Society, uh, an afternoon of talks on Pliny the Younger and the eruption of Vesuvius in AD 79. We are very pleased to have with us today two exceptionally distinguished speakers to address us on various aspects of this topic. Our first speaker is Professor Pedar Foss of DePaul University in Indiana. Uh, he is professor of classical studies there. He did his PhD at the University of Michigan in classical art and archaeology. But before that, very interestingly, he did the somewhat unusual uh, joint honors degree of classics and chemistry. And from the chemistry side of that, he learned how to uh, use scientific evidence, scientific reports, and I'm sure that that will feed in very usefully to uh, the talk that he's going to give us this afternoon. Uh, he is by training an archaeologist and he has worked in the field in many locations in Greece and Turkey and Tunisia and more recently concentrating on the ancient Bay of Naples uh, and the landscape archaeology there. Uh, he is with uh, John Dobbins, author of the book uh, The World of Pompeii, which was published in 2007. Uh, but more immediately relevant to today's talk is the forthcoming book, Pliny and the Eruption of Vesuvius, uh, which will be published by Routledge uh, at the end of March, so in a few weeks' time. And what we're privileged to get this afternoon is a preview of some of the key findings in that book. And I think it's fair to say that this is going to be the definitive work on the eruption of Vesuvius. Uh, Professor Foss has done a tremendous amount of research uh, to uh, write this book. He's looked at many uh, dozens of manuscripts of Pliny the Younger's letters. He's looked at all of the archeological and historical evidence, and he's also uh, looked at um, the volcanology and put this all together into the most complete uh, account uh, in existence of the eruption of Vesuvius, and I'm sure it's going to be uh, the definitive account for many years to come. So we're uh, looking forward very much to hear him speak this afternoon on Ashy Tuesday, Wednesday, the date and sequence of the AD 79 eruption. Professor Foss. Well, good day. I'm very honored to speak to you all today. I want to thank the Society, Bob Fowler in particular, for organizing, and to my friend and colleague Roy Gibson for sharing this event and for being such a great, great help during my book project. I'm presenting two parts of that project, which examines Pliny the Younger's two letters about the AD 79 eruption of Vesuvius. I owe particular thanks to Michael Reeve for conversations about the manuscripts, Brian Hansen for his statistical Savvy and Beth Wilkerson for helping to build a GIS of the pre eruption topography of the Bay of Nap Naples, which is already freely available, along with all of the data behind this project at the uh, Rutledge.com website for the book. My presentation today has two parts. First, I'll describe a new comprehensive collation of the Vesuvian letters, the construction of a new stemma or family tree for the source tradition, decipherment of the heretofore mysterious theta branch of that tradition, and implications for understanding the eruption date in written sources, specifically how options other than August 24th have come about. In the second part, I will reconstruct and characterize, according to the latest evidence, the sequence of that eruption. Now, the traditional stemma for Pliny's letters, developed between 1853 and 1963, divided into eight, nine, and ten book traditions. That is, gamma, alpha slash theta, and pi slash beta. Of these, we have or know of specific texts that source all of the families except one, theta. 
Now, to have the most well-informed text, I collected scans of 79 of the 80 known extant manuscripts and read many of them in person. The 80th is not accessible, but it is late in the 1460s and it doesn't affect the results of the study. I also included printed editions. I then collated the most variable readings across all of them, according, uh, recording both the literal readings with abbreviations, spelling, spacing, and also restored or normalized readings for each, adding up to nearly a third of all words in both letters. When complete, the database will exceed 170,000 entries. I have some later printed editions to finish. Uh, when it's done, it may in fact go more towards 200,000, all of them entered by hand. Now the size of this sample has made empirical stematology possible. And through a recursive process of statistical analysis and traditional comparison of readings, I've been able after four years to draft a new and far more detailed family tree. This new stemma includes all extant and hypothesized texts down to the present day. The stemma is provisional. I understand that as little as 10% of manuscripts have survived. Also, it is most accurate for the Vesuvian letters. Additional work will be required for the entire epistulae, although I have also selectively collated letters in books one, five, and eight. It's a start, but I think it's safe to say that while previous scholars did an amazing job with a relatively small number of texts, a new full critical edition of Pliny's epistulae is going to be necessary. But now we know the key texts to collate and more about how they relate to each other. In Italy, during the 15th century, only one manuscript contained the Vesuvian letters. That was Gamma. It was furiously copied after being rediscovered at Verona in 1419, and its descendants comprised 95% of extant manuscripts that contained the Vesuvian letters. Two branches of gamma are key to our story. Gamma 3b1, which emerged in the late 1420s, you see marked in the orange there, and also revisions made by Lorenzo Valla in Naples around 1438. We'll examine them shortly. Though previous scholars had noticed curious clusters of readings, it was S.E. Stout who first argued that they comprised another family, which he called Theta. Miners confirmed and refined the theory, and Theta has become canon for the Plinian tradition. Theta's main features seem to be that it made many corrections that matched alpha or pi readings, it filled in lacunae from the gamma, gamma family, and it contains some of the book eight letters missing entirely from Gamma. Still, Theta's origin and nature remained unclear. So let's see what Theta actually is. And I wanna give credit to Michael Reeve who provided the solution key for all of this. First of all, we need a manuscript written at Rome in October, 1453, Vatican Reg Lat 1472 which I'm gonna call R1472 from now on. It belongs to the gamma 3b1 branch noted earlier. It had a hypothetical descendant, C0. Note, it is common to posit hypothetical sources from clues preserved in their descendants. Now we have to detour to Naples in 1438, where Lorenzo Vella made numerous conjectures to his own personal copy of the letters. His conjectures were insightful, and in my sample, he was correct 54% of the time. His personal copy, Vala, spawned several descendants, most importantly, LL52, uh, right there in Oxford. Vala brought his copy 
when he moved to Rome in 1448. And there in Rome, valor readings were annotated into C naught and then integrated into its descendant C. Now it gets interesting. Before C was bound, book eight letters preserved in a theta source at Rome were appended at the end as book nine by the very same scribe. C has no other theta readings. C was a presentation copy to the young Francesco Piccolomini, the future Pope Pius III. C naught also had another descendant, F naught. It received annotations from Theta as well, but no Book Eight because it had already been bound. A descendant of F naught, F integrated those Theta readings and moved to Naples. Another offspring of F naught, Q naught, was copied, but this time in conjunction with full access to Theta, so that it received additional Theta readings as well as the book eight letters uniquely set in their proper place between books seven and nine. A presentation copy of Q naught, Q, survives from the 1460s. Now, Around 1474, Johannes Schuriner's printing press at Rome was preparing an edition called R to compete with the Venetian Editio Princeps. The editor used as his base text the very same R1472 that was parent to C naught. He heavily annotated R1472 with readings from a theta source that amended manuscript became R naught. He then added the book eight letters from the theta source as book nine directly onto the end of R. Those book eight letters then joined the 1476 Naples printing, which also used F. <laughs> I know it's crazy, right? R and theta then uh, were also sources for later manuscripts and printed copies. Simply put, what Stout and Miners thought was theta was really the combination of Vala conjectures and a true and increasingly tattered theta source. Now to the eruption date in the texts. Let's consider our oldest and best sources independently from the 10 and nine book families. The fifth century Pi on the right, preserved in the 1508 Aldus edition and in an extremely rare 1504 Barrow Aldus edition, um, which is a precious and underappreciated source that needs more research. As well as on the left, two ninth century alpha sources they all read the same, the ninth day before the calends of September, that is August 24th. The formula for Roman dates comes in two flavors, ablative and accusative, but the number of days before the month marker, calends, knowns, or ides, comes first and then the month marker as an accusative plural noun, and finally the adjectival month. This is true in 97.1% of all instances in surviving Latin literature through Tacitus. In another 2.2% of cases, the order adapts to poetic meter. And we should remember the counting is inclusive. Both the first and last days are included. For the gamma and theta families of text, the situation is different. Those families which shared a common ancestor did not preserve a month name. Just the number, ninth day, before the calends of blank. The number nonum is consistent across all key gamma subfamilies except one, gamma 3b1, which includes the important R1472 manuscript that we've highlighted. In that branch, we literally see something new marked in the orange there, no-wum, 
which makes no sense for a date. This happened because an ancestor had a reading ambiguous between no num and no wum. N and U are easily and commonly confused in minuscule scripts. I think we can trace the error. I argue that a known copy made by Flavio Biondo between 1424 and 1425 was ambiguous in just this way. Its surviving descendants read either as nonum or noum, variously abbreviated, and one of those descendants is R1472, which simply reads new, N-O-U. So here's the diagram we built before, but now showing readings for the eruption date. R1472 is the key source. Originally, it read new, N-O-U, leading to similar readings in descendants influenced by Vala and Theta. Note, the new with the long macron in C and Q may construe November, it's not entirely clear. But new was definitely altered to November by the editor of the second printed edition, R. This is not syntactically correct. If they want to say November 1st, it should be Calendis Novembribus. Let's take an even closer look. First, proof that the R editor used R1472 for his printed edition, and the proof comes through a spectacular error. The stylized U beginning usus in R1472, marked in blue, was printed as the nonsensical zisus in R. This mistake occurs nowhere else. Next, R1472 had a sibling, Fat Lat 5881, written simultaneously by the same scribe, Valerius San Venantius, in late 1453. He left a space after new in R1472 because the passage was problematic. He left the very same space in Vatlat 5881, but this time he wrote non, perhaps because that abbreviation for nonum made more sense than a mysterious new. Again, minuscule ambiguity in the exemplar. How do we know that November is not original to R1472? Well, I compared all 41 examples of EMB, MBR, BRIS, or BRES letter sequences in the original manuscript. Their forward slanted shape and smooth edges do not match the upright stance and sharper nib of the R editor's emendations. Consider particularly the EMB of November, in the upper left to a super linear correction in letter 727.6. You see the same script. Or tellingly, compare Monentem and the R editor's gloss above it in 1107. Finally, we know how San Venantius wrote months like November and October from his colophons in R1472 and Vatlat 5881, as well as a poem he signed in 1454. All of his abbreviations include a backward horizontal slash through the stem of the B and add an R at the end to mark the abbreviation. So you can compare uh, what San Venantius does and what the R editor did. So the editor of R, the second printed edition in Rome is responsible for construing blatantly a November reading. At this point, the ninth day before blank and November 1st were the only options anyone would have seen in Pliny's letters. And because it was in print, despite not being syntactically correct, November got reproduced regularly, 
until the older and less corrupt alpha and pi sources arrived to Italy in the first decade of the 16th century, and an August 24th reading became standard. This might have been the end of the story, except that editors of Elder Pliny's Natural History, starting with Asulanus in 1536, used an outdated 1506 edition of Cataneus that still read November. Their editions included letter 6.16, along with letter 3.5, as biographical prefaces about the elder's life and death. The 1608 Dalacampius also contained an essay arguing that Elder Pliny hailed from Como. Now, Como rivaled Verona to claim the Plinies, and perhaps um, Roy will talk about this in a little bit, I don't know. Um, uh, so a Veronese legal scholar, Polycarpus Palermus, objected to this in a 180 page treatise. Polycarpus wanted to know when the elder died. So he listed dates for the second day of the eruption. One of those dates he got wrong. The third day before the knowns of November was November 3rd, not the November 2nd he wanted to express. Compounding the error, subsequent scholars took his death dates for the dates of the eruption. At this point, four eruption dates were in circulation, three of them clear mistakes. Harduinus mistook the death dates for eruption dates in his 1685 edition, still relying on the obsolete 1506 Cataneus text. But in citing Palermus, his own footnote mark was then mistaken by Rosonico for yet another date, 1 Cal November, which is impossible in Latin. Now there were five dates and four of them were wrong. And then in 1797, Rossini enters the scene. Archaeological finds had led him to doubt an August date, given a simplistic reading of that evidence. So he turned to Cassius Dio's epitomized account of the eruption. In that account, Dio uses the term phthinoporon, which means the last part of late summer. Following the historian Tillemont, Rossini incorrectly doubled the end part of the word fin in translating phthinoporon as the end of autumn. This permitted him to start a trend of contriving his own month to fill the gap of the gamma family, the ninth day before the calends of December, November 23rd. Now, there were six states, five of them incorrect. Rossini's invention inspired two volcanologists to propose yet another date in 1929, October 24th, which doubled the nine from the ninth day into the month of November. Options for dates now numbered seven. And the more options there were, the more uncertain the textual date appeared to be. And you'll see this in a lot of publications in the late 20th and early 20th. 21st century, when the question was revived. And the October 24th date now circulates quite widely, especially after the October 17th inscription was found in the Casa del Giardino at Pompeii in 2018. But that charcoal inscription does not include a year. It was indoors, and it could easily have been on that wall for a long time. So far, no evidence from inscriptions, coins, studies of wind direction, the grape harvest, pomegranates, fish sauce, or anything else has been specific enough, precise enough, and sufficiently indisputable to challenge what Pliny wrote. I examine all of the arguments and evidence in the book. Now that may change with future research, of course. My purpose in this paper 
has been to show that Pliny recorded August 24th as the eruption date and to argue that we should cease trying to bend what he wrote. Future challenges must demonstrate that Pliny was simply wrong and not pretend that he wrote something else. All right, thanks. So that was part one. Uh, I'll let you digest that a little bit while I switch my presentations, um, which are otherwise too large to all present at once. And we'll move on to the eruption sequence. All right, there we go. Okay. Now for part two. <clears throat> Given all the tremendous volcanological work that's been done over the last 45 years to understand the AD 79 eruption, can we synthesize that research into a clear understanding of its sequence and its timing? The two major volcanic complexes in the Bay of Naples, that of Campi Fligrae and Soma of Vesuvius, of course, have a long history and prehistory of activity. But both had largely been quiescent after the Fossa Lupara and Avellino eruptions shortly after 2000 BC. Rumblings did not really resume until the first century AD with earthquakes that wrecked the lighthouse at Capri in 37 and hit the Eastern Bay of Naples from 62 to 64. The last of which coincided with Nero's world premiere vocal performance in Naples, which literally brought down the house. Teatrum collapsum est. One thing we might also want to know is the shape of Vesuvius prior to the eruption. The Bacchic painting from the atriolum of the Casa del Centenario usually gets trotted out, the one on the left there, with its prominent cone resembling the current shape of the mountain, or the painting of two epic lovers from room 20 in the Casa del uh, Quitarista with a more flat-topped mountain behind. But the placement of mythic scenes onto a local landscape is no more likely than showing Bacchus on the slopes of Mount Nisa, or contouring the hilly backdrop of a third style panel painting to the shape of its frame. Written descriptions by Floris, Strabo, and Cassius Dio suggest a broad crater with steep sides inside and out, and a relatively flat, burned out central area with no central cone. We offer in our GIS a stab at reconstructing its pre-eruption shape so that we don't have to continue using modern digital elevation models that are definitely not correct. The crater rim of the old Soma volcano was probably around 1250 to 1300 meters high. Our GIS uses 1270, just above the current rim height of 1132 meters. Just for reference, the elevation of the current ash cone that has arisen since AD 79 is 1,281 meters. Now that rim likely had a break on the west-southwest side towards Herculaneum, echoing a subterranean fracture, a horseshoe-shaped anomaly connected to a secondary caldera collapse during the Avellino eruption. That break may have helped funnel down the first pyroclastic density current that destroyed Herculaneum. So what happened on the morning of 24 August, AD 79? Modern reconstructions of a sequence and timeline still rely heavily on Sigurdsson's foundational study. Sigurdsson used Pliny's account as a temporal framework. From 1300 on the first day, hora fera septima, to an estimated eight o'clock the following morning. Observing the thickness of pyroclastic deposits, he estimated a constant fall rate and durations for the various phases. When the schema is then used to check Pliny's text, however, one of course enters a circular argument.
Initial assumptions may not even hold. We are only told when Plinia, the younger's mother, noticed the cloud and the Plinies were not aware of its source at the time. Using our GIS of the pre-AD 79 Bay of Naples, we have calculated a viewshed analysis asking where at Mycenaeum local topography would have blocked direct view of Vesuvius. We set the test at two meters above sea level, taking clues from the letters that Elder Pliny's villa was close to the town, but also on the water adjacent to the military harbors. The best option turned out to be the west side of Punta Sarparella, suggested back in 1879 by Belloch and marked by the red dot there. It's been uh, also agreed upon by other scholars since, uh, including Roy. At that location, one would have had to climb upslope about 15 meters, that is four flights of stairs, to see the erupting volcano. And indeed, Elder, of course, is described as making just such an, asc uh, just such an ascent. The eruption, however, had actually begun earlier that morning, even perhaps overnight, as Sigurdsson noted, in its phreatromagmatic opening. Magma had been rising for some time from seven to eight kilometers below the mountain, fracturing the rock and causing tremors, which were noted by Pliny in letter 620. As the magma rose and its pressure decreased, Gases and water that had been dissolved in the magma began emerging from solution, forming gas bubbles in the magma and then beginning to break it apart. The magma was degassing. But this particular magma was viscous, which kept the gases trapped until it rose to the level of groundwater. The magma superheated the water into steam, which fragmented the magma and broke open the rock that had stopped up the old conduit, creating an initial phase, an initial plume of ash 15 kilometers high that spread lightly to the east. This opening may have triggered the rescue message that a woman named Rectina, living somewhere on the coast below Vesuvius, sent to Elder Pliny that day. The opening of the vent reduced magma pressure further, which meant that trapped gases expanded ever more quickly and violently, accelerating magma upward, where it shattered into a plume of ash and white pumice some 27 to 30 kilometers into the stratosphere. This plume is what Plinia saw around 1300, although it probably occurred prior to that. Young Pliny described it famously as a shape only a pine tree could have resembled. High level winds that day carried fallout south southeast where Pompeii suffered nearly 150 centimeters of the stuff in that phase. Almost nothing fell in Herculaneum and the cloud incrementally rotated towards the southeast over the next 19 hours or so. Elder Pliny, after sticking to his daily habit of sun bath, a dip in the sea, some lunch and some study time, finally climbed up to see what was going on and realized what a fantastic study opportunity had presented itself to a man who had recently finished the natural history. All these activities, plus calling up a light ship, a Libernica, receiving Rectina's message and fitting out his largest transports quadrimes to shift into rescue mode could not have taken less than two hours. At earliest, the Admiral would have set out at around 1500. I should note that in reading this passage about the ships, scholars have assumed that Pliny switched his Liburnian for a larger quadrireme. This has caused some consternation. Why could the power of 176 rowers not have pulled him out of the cul-de-sac at Stabiae later on, even in heavy seas and winds? Then some have compared the mini biography of Elder Pliny, probably written by Suetonius, 
it's on the bottom half of your screen, which states that Pliny sailed out in a Liburnian. And then they conclude that the younger was a liar. <laughs> but the Latin doesn't say that Pliny himself switched ships. It just says that he added quadrivenes to the mission and that he boarded. The verb ascendit looks forward towards laturus auxilium, not backward to quadrivenes, which is already the object of de ducat. Elder kept the ship he had already readied. It would have taken plenty at least three, three and a half hours to sail direct to Stabiae after hitting the coast below Vesuvius. But that's not necessarily all he did. A nine meter launch boat and a Marine in his forties who may have been supervising evacuation were found during excavations in 1982 at the Herculaneum beach, as, as you all know. The skeleton is being reevaluated, and Serrano has suggested it represents a high-ranking officer. It seems likely that Elder Pliny studied the eruption on his Liburnian command ship while transport detachments attempted coastal rescue operations, as Domenico Caro has argued. So plenty of ships were operating off the coast towards evening. Twilight would have held until, until nearly 1930 hours that day. And it is in this time frame that the magma composition of the eruption changed. Pressure and temperature spiked and the pumice fall shifted from a white to a higher density gray. The eruption plume lessened briefly and this, combined with the denser pyroclasts, precipitated the first large column collapse. And the resultant pyroclastic density current, or PDC, that poured forth both east over Terzigno and through the west-southwest structural gap to Herculaneum, killing everyone. Sigurdsson thought the PDC ravaged the town overnight, but Shioni's teams have shown since the early 1990s that it struck at the white gray pumice transition, which Sigurdsson originally estimated between 19 and 20 hundred hours on the evening of the first day. Scandoni's suggestion, going back in some form, at least to Sullivan and Ippolito, that Elder Pliny saw this PDC while he was offshore is persuasive. The elder was taking and dictating accounts that his nephew would use to compose his letters. And he used the same vocabulary for volcanic, volcanic activity at Vesuvius that he used in the natural history to describe gold mining in Spain. This technique sluiced for gold by first orchestrating montane landslides on an enormous scale, what Pliny calls ruina montis. And I think this is an example, and I credit Roy for this, that Pliny the Younger in his writing actually um, takes quite a bit from his, from his uncle, more than has been appreciated. Pliny, unable to reach shore, cut south to the port of Stabiae and his friend Pomponianos, which was close to, but not yet under, heavy gray fallout, as he noted. Pliny could not have been further east, up on the Verano Plateau, where great houses like the Villa Ariana were located. The fallout was simply too heavy there. It's like the old joke about everybody's hometown. It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from here. Pliny and his toast could see it from there. Overnight, while Pliny snored, a series of eruptive column collapses triggered PDCs, one smothering a plantus in Boscoriale around 1 a.m., and another hitting the villa of Gaius Olius Ampliatus on the north slope about an hour later. It also sheared off standing structures at Herculaneum. By dawn, around 5.20 a.m., 
hundreds had already perished from roofs collapsing at Pompeii. And near the end of the first hour, a thin ashy PDC reached into the northern edges of the city. It doesn't appear to have been terribly dangerous. And then there was a lull around seven o'clock or so. Some surviving Pompeians clambered out onto drifts three to five meters high. Both Plinies at opposite ends of the bay must have taken this opportunity to try escaping. Some people wore heavy woolen clothes, not because it was cold, but because of the thermal protection wool offered against falling pyroclasts, which by this point measured 180 to 220 degrees Celsius, hot enough to burn exposed skin in less than a second. We know this thanks to Zanella's thermal rem uh, remnant magnetization studies. Elder Pliny's party strapped pillows on their heads to deal with the problem. Then two more PDCs in quick succession overlap the city, killing nearly everybody else. But because architecture affected their intensity on a localized basis, a few individuals, it seems, were still standing. Two hiatuses separated by brief fallout seem to offer a final chance for survivors. As Scarpati's recent study has shown, rain began to erode gullies across the contours of the volcanic deposits. Younger Pliny and his mother made their way slowly along the beach road west of Mycenaeum. Elder Pliny stopped on the beach for a drink of cold water after seeing that the ships couldn't leave and he was attended by two slaves there. And during all this time, groundwater began to re-enter the eruption equation. This re-established a phreatomagmatic dynamic. Earthquakes destabilized the magma chamber and the caldera began to collapse. This was very bad. And finally, perhaps around eight o'clock, the final and most devastating total column collapse occurred. It triggered a three-part PDC that rolled across the entire bay. At 300 kilometers an hour, when it hit Pompeii, it shoved back the top three surviving rows of ashlar blocks on the city's northern fortifications. It dropped some 80 centimeters of deposit at Stabii, killed Elder Pliny near the edge of its lethal surge, terrified the people fleeing Mycenaeum as described in the Younger's letter 6.20, and even left a layer, still nine centimeters thick to this day, 30 kilometers out to sea at a depth of 141 meters at core C69 practically to Capri. The aftermath was a dirty, snowy wilderness. I know that Steve Tuck has recently presented his research to you on how to understand how survivors coped. For me, that's all I have for now. There's much more in the book, of course. And although we can't really share Apple TV virtually, let's at least look forward someday to gatherings in person, perhaps under the moonlight, perhaps at Mycenaeum. I'd certainly drink to that. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Peter, for that amazing presentation. Uh, or actually a double presentation on the manuscripts. What a labor of Hercules that was to collect all of those variants and analyze them and equally detailed research on, on the sequence of the eruption. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Our second speaker this afternoon is Professor Roy Gibson, who is professor of classics at uh, Durham University. Uh, his research interests in uh, Latin literature are very wide. He's written on Cicero and Ovid, 
uh, and uh, on Pliny the Younger in particular, and he's heading up a very large research project on the whole of ancient uh, letter writing, epistolography. Um, he has uh, quite recently published uh, a biography of Pliny the Younger called the, the Man of High Empire, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. And he is preparing an edition of book six of Pliny's letters, which includes the two about Vesuvius uh, for Cambridge University Press in their acclaimed uh, green and yellow series. Uh, so uh, very uh, much looking forward to hearing what uh, Roy has to say today on From Como to the Bay of Naples, Pliny's Epistolary Italy. Over to you, Roy. Yeah, I think you've just seen why Professor Foss's, Foss's book is going to be a step change in the field. Um, I've been very lucky to have a, a, for a sneak peek of it, and uh, it really is going to change how we understand the course of the eruption and indeed how uh, Pliny's involvement in documenting it. Um, Bob had asked me to talk about Pliny uh, um, more broadly and the corpus as a whole, and to look at the Vesuvius letters in that context. And I think that's actually quite useful because I think when we ask ourselves about the eruption and we, we look at the one surviving ancient account, um, we often don't think very closely about um, Pliny uh, himself. So I'm going to look at that today. Um, and I agreed to do this paper in the hope and the expectation that there would be no fellow Pliny experts here apart from Professor Foss. That has not turned out to be the case, so this is rather terrifying. Anyway, um, so I'm just going to get this moving. So here are the, the, the main points I want to make uh, today. I'm going to look through some facts and figures about the corpus and bring out the point that it's not focused uh, on Rome, it's not focused on politics. Instead, Pliny's heavily indebted to the Augustan poetry book. He's learned to make his books distinctive. And one method of making that distinctive is geography. And by comparison, particularly with Cicero's Ad Atticum, Pliny is clearly focused away from southern towards northern Italy. Maybe that's a statement of the obvious, but uh, once you look at the Ad Atticum, that becomes very clear. And he appears to have a near aversion to Campania, apart from Book 6, where in fact, and the start of Book 7, were the Vesuvius letters. Appear. So these are the, the, the plates I'm going to attempt to keep spinning uh, in the course of this paper. So, um, so let's look at some key dates about his birth. Born in 61, he's in his 18th year when Vesuvius erupts and so on. If you go through the normal offices, getting the latus clavus, uh, he's, um, he enters the Senate as Quaestor Augusti, he's Praetor in 93. Domitian assassinated in 96, that's when the, um, the, the letters, the earliest letters date to. So um, he must, of course, have written letters before then, but didn't um, think of editing them for publication. Um, he's the prefect of the treasury, consul suffectus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's the curator of the, the bed and banks of the, of, the, of, the, of the Tiber and so on. It's a very Rome-focused career, but it doesn't actually reflect, I think, the entirety of what's going on in the corpus. Um, let's just look at the uh, the books here. There's ten of them, and they're organised so as to uh, move forward in time uh, from about 97 to possibly 111, 112. And there's overlapping periods of time. Um, though within the books, he feels he um, feels quite free to mix up. The chronology of the letters. In general, the books move forward in time, but within a book, he feels free to move letters around um, in general. And and uh, John Bodell uh, has argued that, um, I think convincingly, that uh, he begins to publish them uh, round about um, uh, in about the year 100, and there's an omnibus edition of them, books one to five, comes out in possibly 106 to 7 C. And there's our book there, book six, which comes out by, well, it's written and covers the year 106 to 7, but it comes out a bit a bit later. Okay, so um, there's 371 letters in total, um, 247 letters in books one to nine, average between 20 and 40 letters per book, but the average, and the average length is about 28 uh, lines in modern edition, which is about average for ancient 
letter collections, letters tend not to be very, very long, unless you're piling this of NOLA, in which case your average is 245 lines. Um, uh, then look at book 10. This is an outlier in all sorts of ways. It's much longer than all the other books. It has replies from another person that's Trajan in it, uh, although the average length goes down to about 10 lines. And one thing that I've, I've learned from studying Asian epistolography as a whole is that people really did send 10 line letters over hundreds and hundreds of miles distance to one another because they were, they were relying on couriers, um, strange as it might seem. Okay, so books one to nine contain over a hundred addressees and um, Syme, uh, his famous summary, the Pliny and Company is a genuine assemblage from consular down to small friends at home. The large nucleus is local and regional, nor was Pliny at pains to solicit illustrious names. And that's, um, that's quite important. It's not a, this is not a Rome-focused um, set of addresses that we're going to see in a second. In particular, under half of them can be identified as holding senatorial rank which is quite different from Cicero's ad familiaris, where senators predominate. And that's probably characteristic of um, Cicero's correspondence as a whole. It's the ad that comes a bit of an outlier, uh, as, it were, as indeed was Atticus himself, uh, being of equestrian status. So just a hundred, under 140 of the 247 letters of books one to nine appear to be addressed to an inner circle of about 28 correspondence. These are the people who get three or more letters each. And the biggest identifiable group within, uh, within this core set of addressees uh, are people united by origins and connections with the Transpadana. Um, so Common, Novaria, Tachinum, Mediolanum, Brixia, Bergam, these are all more or less in a circle around um, uh, uh, Common. So there is quite a regional uh, focus. He's quite keen to promote common in that in that regard. Now I'm not saying he went there very often. I think um, um, I, 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 it has been argued that um, in fact Pliny only goes to common once during the whole uh, sort of 12 or 13 years covered by the, the correspondence. A certain extreme view but but it's certainly it's, it's, it's a possible one but he wants to give common um, as much um, prominence as he can. Okay, what this is a Sher Sherwin White's um, uh, listing of the, the, the type of letters that you get. Cicero's letters in particular are all entirely political. They're, they're, they're waiting for political news, complaining about not having, having news, occasionally bits about literature um, uh, and so on, but fundamentally political is what, is, what, is, what, is what most of them are. Much, much broader range in Pliny. Yes, you do get public affairs, but there's much more than that, including this um, category here, which is looking at landscape uh, quite a lot. I mean, it's basically taking over a poetic tradition uh, here. Okay, so um, if we want to understand Pliny, it's important to look at what the tradition is before him. Now, of course, you know we've lost 98% roughly uh, of all ancient literature. But I think as Reveal Nets has argued for Greek literature, and I think this holds for Latin literature, prestige is what tends to guarantee survival. And we have really quite a good sample of prestigious um, classical literature, as it were. So I don't think we're missing any terribly important. Um, we're missing lots of Cicero, but we have lots of Cicero anyway, but this is the order in, in which they're published. Horace is really the foundation in Latin of, of the, well, of the, of the well-conceived letter collection, and there's Ovid's two collections. The mm -hmm. Pistolae Herodon we can't say much about because um, it's, it's heavily interpolated, and we don't understand the relation between the single and double Herodes. Pistolae Ponto, much easier to, uh, to, to talk about. And it's only after that point that the ad from, well, the ad familiaris doesn't exist as a collection, probably doesn't exist as a collection until the, probably the fifth century, I think, maybe even later than that. It's, it's a compilation of previously circulating books. But books that constituted the ad familiaris are in circulation by the 30s, and the ad atticum is in circulation by probably by the, the 60s. 
Now, um, Justin Stover has published published an extremely interesting article in in Ciceroniana online, showing that um, Cicero's books, uh, the size of them vary quite uh, dramatically. The uh, rhetorical books were enormous, uh, the philosophical books were smaller, and the epistolographical books, which of course Cicero himself didn't put together, are roughly the size of the Augustan poetry book. Now, I think it's the clearest sense that the people who put these together are operating in the era after the Augustan poetry book and are aiming for the slim volume aesthetic that you get there. And he shows also that this size, the epistolographical works of Cicero, set the size for the book for the next century or so. It, 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 it helps to some extent. It correlates with the average in Seneca, correlates with the average in Plenty. Now, we're a long way from the eruption of Vesuvius, but we'll get there eventually. This is to show the, the literary nature of the correspondence. Okay, so what did Pliny learn from these collections? Well, he learned all about symmetry from Horace and Ovid, and there's loads of symmetry in Pliny. The, the, the first and letter of book one, the last bit, uh, letter of book nine, the symmetry within books. And um, he also learned the principle of variety and non-chronological arrangement within books absolutely standard. Uh, you get it in, in Virgil's Eclogues, you get it in Tabullus, uh, Propertius, principle variety, non-chronological arrangement. That's where he's coming from. He also learned that he needs to pay attention to the character of his individual books. I think probably the greatest example of this is Propertius, each of whose four books are very, very distinctive, as it were, but he learns from them. And in this context, what's important to understand is that Horace and Ovid are not aberrations. People say, they're not real letters. Why, you know, why, why are you thinking about them? Well, they're the founding fathers of the epistolographical tradition. They said that in Greek epistolography, um, the book unit is, is irrelevant. Um, the only two epistolographers up till the fifth century who use the book unit are Alcaphron and Libanius. No one else has them. It's a Roman thing. And Pliny's working within this tradition. He's learned from Cicero about a standardised book length and from Seneca he learns that he needs to um, uh, champion rhetoric against philosophy. Okay, um, so Pliny's books, despite variation in letter length, are deliberately crafted to be of the same length, So, so and they're all roughly the same, the same length as the Augustan Poetry book. They're made distinctive by the privileging of certain types of letter or certain themes within particular books and they're made distinctive through geography which is why I'm particularly interested in today. So um, the uh, here's a map of Pliny's Italy and um, here's the, the places that he's particularly interested in. If we just look at a closer look at that map, um, the first cluster here is, well, this is basically the route from Rome to his villa, which is in the, uh, the valley above uh, uh, Perugia. These are all way stations there. So these gotta get, get some mention. And the other uh, here is this common and this circle of towns around here. He's less interested the further you, that you get east, but this is um, the big cluster here. Um, in Southern Italy, well, the Laurentine villa on the shore near Rome gets a lot of attention. He records visits to here, to the imperial villa at Kenton Kelly, um, the villa of Virginius Rufus in Alcium, and uh, he's less interested in this coast here. Formiae, really important in Cicero, hardly appears in Pliny, and this in many ways is an aberration. We're going to look at that aberration when we get to book six. Um, okay, so distinctive geographical focus in, in Pliny. Um, so I think that, um, I mean, we can argue uh, about this, but I, I think that some of the books do tend to have a geographical, distinctive geographical focus. I think Common, Rome and the Laurentine Shore get quite a lot of coverage in books one and two, certainly what's called the Tuscan Villa, although it's really in, in Umbria. So I often call them um, the Umbrian Villa because he's very interested in Umbria. Um, so books four and five do trace a journey to Comum, um, to 
uh, via the estate near Tiferon to Berin, when Umbrias, the Tuscan estate, so called. Uh, book six, as we'll see, is Campania, the only one apart from the start of book seven, which features Campania, but Common is quite dominant in book seven, not because Pliny goes there himself, because a friend of his goes there and he takes an interest in what happens. I think that book eight is really the Umbria book and the Upper Tiber book. There's a, um, he, he describes the um, the uh, uh, Fonte del Plutuno, the, so the springs at uh, um, Clitumnus, he talks about the flooding of the Tiber, uh, and so on and so on. And then book 10 is Pontus by Thinia. So, um, well, we should look at some pictures first, because it, I think that Pliny is Latin literature's greatest author of a uh, writer about the Italian uh, uh, landscape. He's better than he, he's he's better than Virgil in a way. He's uh, uh, um, he's a huge geographical range. Uh, he really uh, the, the descriptions he provides um, are are are, uh, are 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 quite amazing. I think he needs to be appreciated more in this regard for being uh, a real innovator in in this in this regard. So, of course, this is um, taken from Brunate, which overlooks Comum itself, which is down here um, in, uh, in in the valley. So we talked a lot about Comum. You can see how close to the Alps it is here from Brunate on a clear day. You, you can see you can see the Alps with snow on them. Um, this is where some of his um, his villas are said to be. This is from Bellagio on the shoreline at Bellagio. As you know, it's quite a big promontory. Looking towards Leno in the distance, where one of his other villas is said to be. So this is Com so this is Tragedy, who's on high heels, so large promontory. Whereas Comedy down here is said to be um, on her slippers. I, there's no actual, no actual evidence that Bellagio and Leno are the place. In fact, this is probably the, the best evidence here. You'll have seen this if you've been to in Leno. It's on the uh, it's on the shorefront. There's no evidence apart from that, but it's nice to go. Um, right, Umbria. So you can see here, he, uh, please coming up from Rome through a curriculum takes this branch of the Via Flaminia, which gets him um, across to Sp Spoleto. There's the Fonte del Clituno. We know he's connected with his, his spellum through an inscription. And he makes his way up past Perugia to Tiferum Tiberium, which he's the patron of. And then that's his um, villa. That's his villa there, the Colaplinio, on the Colaplinio. So this is um, uh, this is uh, just, at the, uh, well, halfway up the Colaplinio. You're looking at the Tiber down here, amidst all that greenery. And he himself, it's a very gentle slope up. Um, and you don't even realise that you're, that you're, that you're climbing. Here's what uh, Paolo Bracconi, the University of Perugia, discovered in the 1990s and early 2000s. This is the initial stage. The next stage went even further um, here. It was a lot better preserved right up until the 1960s when the local aristocratic landowners started using deep ploughs on the land. <laughs> it really messed everything up. So nothing exists above at below foundation level, as it were, just the, or below floor level. But this is what um, Bracconi thinks he found, which is um, a temple complex and agricultural buildings. And then the real villa is up here, where the modern estate of the aristocratic landowners is, but there's no one's allowed in there, uh, basically. And um, there are rumours of what's in the basement of the villa, but no archaeologist has been allowed to see it. And, possibly never will. So, um, okay, um, here's the Fonte del Clutuno. In antiquity, of course, a very fast running stream, but a deep and beautiful pool now. It's really a 19th century reconstruction. Uh, it's, that's in Umbria. This is the least worth seeing of all Plinian sites. This is Lago Vadimone, which it took me a long time to find this one. And when I did, it was a pond in a field. So I've been there, so, so, so you don't need to. So this, 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 is, this, this is what you'll see. He talks about it in, in, as a wonder of the world. Well, it has shrunk since, since his time. Okay, this is his, um, Laurent, this is, uh, so you can see Rome here. This is the Tiber. And then this is today's the, the estate of the, the Italian president. And there are two possible villa sites. One's inside 
the, um, the state of the Italian present, the, the so-called Grotti di Piazza site, excavated by Amanda Claridge at Royal Holloway, among others. And then there's a, a public access site here um, called the Palombara. And this is the ancient shoreline was published roughly here, as it were. So it's, it's been suggested either one of these two sites here. If you go there uh, today, well, this is how people have imagined it. This is, um, this is 1838. Um, but really, if you go there today, it's a warning. It's a series of small walls. Um, okay. So, and then my saying, um, and this, of course, is where the Elder Pliny um, uh, uh, leaves from with the Imperial fleet to go to um, uh, the rescue of Rectina, and then eventually Pomponianus. And this is... Um, my guidebook to Nakaya told me that the theatre theater no longer existed, so I was most pleased to see that that actually wasn't the case. It was actually being um, renovated by uh, one of the Turkish universities. I know this looks like a building site in Rochdale, but it, but it is um, it is actually the, uh, the the ancient theatre, and I'd like to go back to see what they've uh, done with it. Okay, so geographical focus is a thing in ancient letter collections. You get it in Horses of Pistuli, the Roman Sabine farm. You get it in Ovid's oh, Epistulae ex Ponto per force, Thomas. It's very intermittent in Seneca. You, um, but Book Six is an obvious example, Campania. I, I wonder if there's a consonance between Pliny and Seneca there. I, do, I don't know. Pliny does like playing with numbers. But if you really want to see geography in action in, in a letter collection, you need to look at the ad. Atticum, which is a wonderful, wonderful read from beginning to end. And now the reason why geography is so important in the Atticum is because often Cicero writes people precisely when he's away from Rome and he needs information from people who either know what's happening in Rome or in Rome. And I think this is why we, it's such an amazing set of locations. So Book two is um, it's the it's, it's the coast of of, of Latium, Antium, and Formiae. Book three, he's exiled in Thessalonica and Dyrrhachium, but takes a very interesting detour through the toe of Italy on on the way there. Books five and six are the journey to and from Cilicia via via Athens. He takes three months to get to Cilicia and tells you about his journey on the way. Book seven and ten, he's on the coasts of Latium and Campania, but he seems to have had some. Um, duty to, to guard the coast of Campania in the opening months of civil war. Book 11, he's stuck in Brundisium uh, after Pharsalus. Book 12, he's in Astura in Latium after, after the death of Tula on the coast again. Book 13, he's in Tusculum in Rome in 45. Book 14, again, he's on the Latium and Campania coast after the assassination of Caesar. Doesn't go to Rome very often. And then in book 15, he's in Arpinum on the Latian coast and Campania coast. And book 16, he starts a very uh, a journey by boat down the west coast of Italy, gets as far as going around the toe, a place called Luca Petra, but ha then turns back when he hears that there's been a, a recall of the Senate. So this is um, a, a geographically very, very interesting and distinctive collection. So Cicero generally goes no further than north than Rome and Tusculum. He's oriented towards southern Italy, especially Latium and the Campania coast. He twice goes to Greece, second time en route to Asia Minor. Now, finally, back to Pliny. By the standards of his class, Pliny is very little travelled outside Italy. Before Pontus by Pliny, he appears only to have been in Syria. So it's a very, very Italian-focused collection. Above all, he's focused on Italy and Italy north of Rome, above all. Book six aside, Campania and Southern Latium are a notable absentee from Pliny's epistolary Italy. By the way, if you want to see how much effort Cicero puts into describing the scenery, this is, this is quite typical. He's at Astura. He says, I should really like this place and like it better every day, but for the reason I mentioned in my earlier letter. Nothing could be more agreeable than this solitude, apart from a temporary interruption by the son of a Mintas, tiresome proser that he is. All else is truly quite charming. The house, the shore, the view of the sea, indeed, everything. Well, if you're interested in politics, you're not going to be spending time 
to describe in the sea view. It's a bit different in Pliny, who, and you'll notice this in, in, the, um, in the Vesuvius letters, how would the eye for landscape that he has is really quite amazing and distinctive. Here's, here's him describing his, his Tuscan villa. It's only just a small selection. It says, my property at the very foot of the Apennines. Pick to yourself a vast amphitheater such as it could only be the work of nature. The great spreading plain is ringed round by mountains. My house is on the lower slopes of a hill, but commands as good a view as it were higher up. For the ground rises so gradually that the slope is imperceptible, and you find yourself at the top without noticing the climb. Behind it is the Apennine Range. So the, if you've you know, written the Vesuvius letters and you think, and um, the attention to detail and to landscape in those letters is entirely typical of Pliny and something that he's worked very hard at to make his collection distinctive. So Pliny's Campania, and this is a shot from um, uh, on top of Mycenae. So Pliny, and we're looking at his 100 addressees um, earlier. Um, he seems to know precisely two people with Campanian roots, Pontius Alephanus and the wife of Brutus Prices. Now, I, I might have missed some, but they're not, don't appear to be a big, big presence. He doesn't know a lot of people in, or at least if he does them, know them, he doesn't want to give them prominence. It's the, it's the common lot who uh, seem to get a lot more. The first time that Campania is mentioned in the epistles, I think, is in uh, letters 3-7, and it's in a very particular and quite jaundiced context. The news has just come in that Silas Italicus has starved himself to death in his house near Naples, and there follows a long and passive-aggressive review of the career and mediocre literary outputs of Silas Italicus. And that is a kind of, so your first view of campaign is quite a jaundiced one. Silas Italicus, who Pliny clearly doesn't like or rate, and he's just killed himself there. Now, we know that Pliny's wife, Calpurnia, owned a villa in Campania, but of this villa, there is no mention till book six, the Vesuvius book. When she does go to convalesce in the Campanian villa, Pliny asks, whether you pass, this is, yeah, he writes to her to say, did you pass through the retreats, pleasures and richness of the region without receiving any hurt? And that appears to include moral hurt, as it were. Now, Pliny's been a bit old fashioned here. This is the virtuous son of a small town at the foot of the Alps, which are, they're very um, proud of their, their local version of that. Uh, Pata Vinitas, that is to say, the old Italian rigid sobriety. And he's bringing a bit of that into his letters. There's a suspicion of Campania. Now, in the 90s, Statius had already begun to show how old fashioned that was. His celebration and talking about the Bay of Naples as being a nurturer of long marriages was a new view of the, of the Bay of Naples, but Pliny is having none of that, no interest in that. Likewise, as, um, as this excellent collection of essays by Fielding and Newlands has shown, Campania is a center of literary activity and it's an imaginative fulcrum in Roman literature, but not generally for Pliny, who avoids it. Common Umbria, the shore near Rome, these are for him the imaginative places. Um, and he likes to uh, Pliny likes to Virgilianize the coasts that are north of Rome, just as um, Virgil had Virgilianized the coast south of Rome, and at the mouth of the Tiber, Pliny takes that up uh, to Kentum Celli and Alcium. Campania, only in Book Six. So let's look now at the flourishing of Campania in Epistle Six, and this is um, uh, uh, a photograph taken from the summit of Vesuvius when the clouds briefly parted uh, when I was there. And you can just see the um, uh, uh, Verano Hill, which is where the, uh, more, um, the, the villas mentioned earlier are and where the elder Pliny uh, presumably died on the beach below. Okay, so let's look at the um, Campania in Epistle 6. So 
um, there's a single mention of common and uh, it, it comes back in book seven. So common is not really important here. There's no mention of the Tuscan villa, which had got such prominence in book five. Uh, that, that'll come back really in book eight. Instead, we get this series of letters here. So letters six, four and six, seven, Calpurnia goes off to convalesce in the Campanian villa. 614, he stays at a friend's villa in Formia. It looks like she, he's en route to join Calpurnia. We then get the first Vesuvius letter, the second Vesuvius letter. Then in 618, he stays at a friend's villa in Campania, on presumably en route again to Calpurnia. Then he arrives at the Villa Camilliana in Campania, which belongs to Calpurnia's family, uh, presumably to meet her there. Yeah, a lot of this is, is left implicit, but I think you can join the dots here. So Campania, virtually absent from the um from from the for, from the correspondence, suddenly gets all this attention in book six. And at the center of that are the two Vesuvius letters, which are they tar over the book in terms of length, like Vesuvius does over the Bay of Naples. And I think what um, Pliny's doing here is he is creating a concentration of Campania, clearly meant to create a thematic home for the Vesuvius letters in Book Six. I tried to emphasize at the beginning the extent to which Pliny is writing in the tradition of the Augustan poetry book. That is clearly through his, uh, his care to make his books all the same length and his care to practice symmetry and variety all point back to the Augustan poetry book. So for me, you know, this is what he's doing. If Campania is absent, the rest, the rest of the correspondence, more or less, um, this is what they're doing here in book six. Now, does the hostility or suspicion towards Campania leak into the other letters? Well, I wonder if it does. What is Campania linked with? Illness, family illness. So that's why she's gone off to Campania and he's worried that she, she'll be made worse by being in Campania in some way. So this is the suspicions of Comum about Campania. Furthermore, if you think about it, there's a link between Campania and family death. That's the elder Pliny, as it were. So we, if we take the Vesuvius letters out of their context, I think we often miss some of the negativity that's going on in these letters in relation to Campania. Now, um, if you contrast this with Statius Silvi 3.5, of course, he's from the Bay of Naples. He's trying to convince his wife to come back with him to, um, to the Bay of Naples, leave Rome. He says, you may, there's kind of a, um, a, a review of the pleasures in the Bay of Naples. You may please to visit the seductive beach of steaming Baiae, or the prophetic Sibyl's numerous abode, or the hills made memorable by the Ilian Ore, or shall it be the flowing vineyards of Bacchagaris, and the dwellings of the Teleboy, where the forest raises a light like the night wandering moon, sweet to frighten sailors, where are the Sorrentine hills, dear to Lias, and no gentle mood, hills that might polyus above all, others enhances with his residence. So he's talking about the whole bay, basically, from um, Mycenaeum to Sorrentum and the healing pools of the veins, and stabias querenata, stabiae, reborn. Shall I rehearse for you my country's thousand darlings? So, um, so um, Statius is writing in the, in, the, in, in the early 90s here, so that's a, um, that's a good decade and a bit, decade and a half, maybe uh, after the, um, the eruption of Vesuvius. He's He's celebrating the revival of the Bay of Naples. Pliny's Campania highlights the devastation of the, of the Bay of Naples nearly 30 years before. There's no stabii reborn for Pliny. That's where the elder Pliny dies. Furthermore, he talks about himself, teenage self, with an imperfect grasp of Constantia. He says this is when he, taught, he asked for his copy of Livy in the middle of the night. He says, I don't know whether to call it steadfastness, constantiam, or imprudence, imprudentiam. You know, I was only in my 18th year. Now, if you know anything about Roman's relation with Constantia, admitting to any lack of Constantia at any point um, 
is a dangerous thing to do. Luckily, he, this is why he tells us how old he was. He's in his 18th year before he could be expected to um, have grasped Constantia. So this is, it's, I think it's all part of a slightly negative portrayal of the Bay of Naples that's going on here. So I have some questions that I don't know the answer to. Why delay telling the story till book six story, the, the um, story of the eruption of Vesuvius? That's 106 to 7. Pliny's eyewitness testimony to Vesuvius and the relationship to the elder Pliny must have made him a minor celebrity. He must have been, how else would Tacitus have known except uh, to write to him, except that, uh, um, you know, this was a well-known fact about him. He must have been asked to tell the story countless times. Why wait till book six uh, to do it, uh, as it were? And I, I just here I think about the, the narrative arc that I think the the, the epistles have. Uh, in, total. in books one to five, Trajan is very frequently away from Rome, and Pliny is quite optimistic. Book seven to nine, when Trajan is continuously in Italy, Pliny becomes quite pessimistic. Now I kind of um, can see why. Um, you know, Trajan started off as Rain talking about partnership with the Senate. When he comes back from Dacia, loaded with booty, what does he do? He builds the baths of Trajan. Now, I don't know if you stood on, on the Acolyte Oppio on top of, you know, the Golden House, and you've looked at the size of the baths of Trajan. I mean, my, my goodness, they're just enormous. Pliny's house was 200 metres away from the baths of Trajan. God never mentions them, never mentions them. These are the buildings of, of someone who has becoming increasingly autocratic, I think. And I just wonder, and book six is the tipping point. Trajan's expected back from Dacia. I wonder what uh, role the Vesuvius letters are playing in this narrative. Okay, I'm just going just to stop there. That's terrific, Roy. Thanks very much. I think a lot of what you had to say will be completely new to uh, many listeners, in, including me. And it really does set book six in an entirely uh, new context and um, uh, gives us a lot to, to, uh, to think about. So um, that uh, concludes the main part of our proceedings here. And uh, uh, I hope that those who've been uh, tuning in uh, remotely uh, or in due course on YouTube, we'll feel inspired to follow some of these themes up and to learn a bit more about Herculaneum, uh, which is very easily done on the website of the Herculaneum Society. So thanks very much for tuning in and we'll sign off there.